So to my right, we have Elena from, the, uh, sorry, from Green Fire Genetics. Next, we have the meme master himself, Mean Gene. And finally, on the end, we've got Kevin Jodry. So, I want to start it off today by basically throwing it out to the panel. What do you guys think of when you hear the word practical breeding? I think it's, it's a broad term, and to a lot of people it means a lot of things. So, let's try to clarify it a bit. Practical breeding, in my eyes, it's stabilization, making sure you don't have intersex traits, looking for, you know, it's to realize every breeder has their own palette. You can give every one of us, you know, almost the same genetics and we're all going to come out with something different. So practical breeding for me is making sure you have stabilized genetics to your environment, no, basically, like I said, intersex issues, make sure everything's hardy, no mold issues, resilient to, you know, outdoor nasty weather. It's basically what I call practical breeding. Making sure that what you do is... Stable. Yeah, stable. Stability is key. I can definitely agree uh, with everything she's saying and um, to add to that, you know, like uh, just basically with practical breeding, uh, trying to reach those goals, you know, it might be a terpene profile or a drug profile, um, but um, basically just trying to get where you're going, you know, and doing those, doing whatever tricks you can, you know, but like she said, definitely uh, resistance to pests and pathogens, um, structure, um, you know, trying to take something, fix it up a little bit, and whether you're increasing the yield, just trying to get to all those goals that you have for everything. Um, I'd say that's definitely the practical side of it, you know. And thanks for all coming. And I always say thank you for listening to me talk, because I'm sure you're very tired of hearing me speak by now. <laughs> um, I look at practical breeding more as a, a functional breeding. And it's really just, what's your objective? And that's ultimately what you choose. And some people are looking for Holy Grail where all things match and work and it's perfect. But for a lot of people, it's just really trying to steer something in a realm that they desire. And that what it does, it allows individuals to be able to make these choices without judgment. And a lot of it becomes, I think, hyper-competitive in breeding where you're all trying to do something unbelievable. For, for a lot of people as they go forward, it's really to first solve the first problem. And like Elena was saying, you know, intersex traits, stability, and gene saying, pathogenic resistance, those are crucial, and those are both separate directions. And the idea with practical reading for me in this, in this context is to decide what is it that you're seeking, and then to go chase that first, and then you systematically work through all these other problems until you get to ultimately a stable package. Cool. So with that in mind, I think like a good way of kind of discussing the practical breeding is let's just say that someone wants to create a line of their own, maybe suited to their farm, their climate, wherever their base. The first thing I would ask is, do you think we should take the kind of Luther Burbank approach that you just described where we're selecting one characteristic and just trying to nail that? Or is it possible to nail multiple things each generation? I personally think it's possible. I mean, honestly, the genetics that are here today are some of the best that I've seen. It's, it's almost hard to get better than what we're seeing besides making it, you know, having such sequential terpenes that are, against, like I said, pathogens and bugs and are so hardy and resilient to mold that that's a, a direction that I think is so important. But I think you put everything together from taste, from the hardiness to yield. I mean, we have plenty of cold bars in our lineup that I believe have, not at all because it's hard to do that, but almost there, you know, and just... I, I truly believe that you, not just one direction with reading, you know, unless you have one specific thing you're going for, like I said, just sticking with it, but I, I think you go, you know, any direction you truly please, because it's like, as a grower, you look for structure that you like, you look for smells that you like, after so many years, you're like, you can look at something in veg and like, you want to, I don't even like that, chuck that, and you're like, oh, wow, like my girlfriend's looking at me, I was throwing out male plants, I was just, what are you doing, they're so beautiful, I'm like, it's not what I'm looking for. You know what I mean? So I, I, I truly believe you can you can search for everything in and um I I'd agree with that for sure. Um the the, the thing is if you know if, if you can take a um take a look at stuff and go ahead and make a list in your head and go, okay, here, you know, here's the end goal and, and that's based on these little objectives along the way. And then um Something that's really cool now is that we're all being able to work with a lot more plants. And when you have a list, if you go, okay, I need it to hit all these things. 
So if you only have a few plants, there, there's not a high likelihood that you're actually going to hit all those marks with a few plants. But if you have a whole lot of plants, then all of a sudden you might say, okay, now going through in this generation, we have, you know, you, you might, there, when you really think about it, there might be 50 things that you, that you really wanted to do. And, um, if you have enough plants, you can look through and you go, wow, this generation, we just got to, you know, we, we, we only had eight of these things really working for us. And now you go through one generation, find these right parents. And all of a sudden you might go from eight traits you want and all of a sudden you're at 35 traits you want in one breeding, you know? And, um, you know, th that being like, um, you, like we were talking about, resistance to things that might be like, oh, this one's really resistant to um, caterpillars, but, you know, spider mites will come out of the trees to find it, you know, and then you might go, oh, but we, we got this one, and look, it actually, um, it doesn't get either of these pests looking for it, and so then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you're there with that one, but with a smaller population, you're not going to hit it, so I think with big populations and a clear goal, um, trying to nar narrow it down where you're hitting all your marks, uh, it really can be done fast, but you, you have to have the idea um, of what you, what, what you, what goals you really want to accomplish, and then as you go through, sometimes you're finding more things that you didn't even realize you wanted, but you see them go, ooh, that's desirable, all right, well, let's lock, lock that in too. Your list might grow as you go. You go, okay, we want these 50 things, and then all of a sudden you see it, and you go, ooh, but they're, okay, let's lock in these other three or four, and you keep moving, but um, it's definitely possible to make a lot of progress really fast with it. I think, I think uh, narrowing down the focus of your direction, meaning I, I want to go with, the, I want to develop a line, and I think a lot of people, use pollination methodologies where they cover a tremendous amount of different parental stock with similar pollen and then chase it out in these broader patterns. And the problem is you can't really find what's coming out of your lines because these populations you need to look at that are big enough, when you start to spread it out in too many different directions, it's kind of hard to figure out what's coming out of the line. So we, scientifically, we can look at traits to find out levels of heterozygosity. So is it is it going to be dissimilar? Is it homozygous? Am I, am I fixed? And science helps, but like Gene, a lot of they, they know their lines well. So when they throw this pollen on something, they say, hey, that's something that I know I don't want or I want. But a lot of that is because they're working their lines heavily with the knowledge base. And I think a lot of people, when they're throwing pollen, they're spreading themselves out too far, too quick. And it doesn't allow them to really go into the plant and find out what are the traits I really see that are coming out of this. Because you're going to have to see a population big enough to find the recessives. And those are the outliers that you're trying to find. Like, you know, when you're talking, you know, caterpillar resistance, mite resistance, I don't know how many plants you gotta go through to find it, but when you find the outlier, you know, okay, in this line, this is what I'm seeking. And then you'll start to find other traits that you can recognize visually that seem to go along because genes appear. They're not just individual light switches. That's the problem with CRISPR technology. CRISPR technology is we're gonna edit things in and out, but when we wipe something out, we also wipe other things out that we're not aware of. And so conventional breeding practices are really this swirling of genes to find concentrations that work in directions. And I think that if you work a similar line, you try to stay constant, you'll, you'll, even if it may not be the end result you want at the end, what you did is you developed an ability to start understanding the pattern of repeatability. And I think that you have to go through that. And I think that breeders are misunderstood for their forward vision of what they really want to see. They have a very clear vision down the road and they chase that and sometimes they don't hit it. But it's okay because the process of chasing it is what really refines the skill set in chasing it. You gotta, you gotta practice it, it's not just papers. Mendelian squares are great, but it doesn't work with polyhybrids. There's too many options. And so this looking and choosing and finding a generation that works and realizing you went the wrong direction, wrong parental stock, you go the other direction, you find the right parental stock. That, that's a huge, a huge skill set that has to be developed, and I think patience is the part that you have to have more than anything. So, I mean, on that topic of going through the stock you created and phenome hunting, what do you guys think about is an appropriate number to phenome hunt with? I mean, a lot of people seem, in my opinion, have growing numbers, and there's kind of this undertone of bigger is always better. Do you agree with that? And what number do you think people should aim to do if they want to, you know, hunt some of their own work to truly find out what's lying inside it? 
Well, I mean, I've seen people pop uh, a 12 pack and find, you know, multiple winners, and then I've seen people talk, you know, pop 100, 200 seeds and not even find a winner. So it's truly in the genetics you're sourcing, you know what I mean? But I've popped, you know, a few skunk seeds from an old, 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 old grow. I mean, I think it was from older than I was, way before pre 96. <laughs> and um, first they didn't pop, next thing they popped, but. Nothing came out too special, and it, it was just, you know, 100 feet seeds. So sometimes it's all about the actual genetics and the parents that you're getting, not just the, the large phenol hunt that you're doing. But if, like, I say something like my dozy dose, for instance, if I pop 500 seeds of that, it's hard to cull, you know, any of them. You know what I mean? Every single one has amazing terpene profiles. I'm just like, do I want the Skittles that's got the lemon and the lime and the citrus, or do I want more of like the OG KB dominant, or you know what I mean? So it's, it's truly amazing to, to go through each phenol and like see how homogenous things truly are and how, you know, sometimes things are fairly on like the ancestor size through different parentals. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. Phenol hunting is something that I think everybody should do. So, um... Yeah, it depends kind of on, on what you're trying to do. Like she said, if you already have something and it's already been taken to a place where there's not much variation, then, you know, you're just trying to find a slight improvement. Like maybe everything's there, but you want it to yield a little better. You might, you might get there, you might only need 10 plants. Or you might even get there without having five, five good girls and you go, okay, well, this one's just a lot bigger. Okay, cool, we're there. For what your goal is, your goal might be simple. But then like if, if like say if there's kind of two different aspects to breeding there's like preservation work or invention work and then there's like um trying to get right to that goal which is more for what like a, a commercial producer really wants where it's like okay this is everything so if you're going to do preservation work ideally you want to have no less than 200 plants all in basically what would be almost like a open field situation you know if it's in a room or whatever but um, that preserves the full genetic um, diversity. But that's different than just trying to go, okay, we really want this big fat bud full of terpenes and THC or CBD or whatever you're going for. So it definitely, the, the, the numbers is different. And then like I said, like invention work, like, you know, you, some, some people are gonna take like really cool things and just put them together and then that can go to other people and then they run with that and then they try to dial it in too so that's all different numbers games it's totally different goals and, and you have to look at it like that when you're going through um, a program but um, you know the numbers are great for me I'm not trying to grow a thousand plants on one thing because how am I going to smoke a thousand plants and see which one is really the best so you really can't be hands-on in a giant population. That's good for, uh, once you have it to where you like it, but you have one issue, and that's all you're trying to fix, then a thousand is great, because you go, here's the one the caterpillars didn't eat out of a thousand, because you couldn't find that in, in 50 seeds if, if that's how it worked. But, um, you know, it, it's definitely, if you really want to know what's the best smoke and what people really like, you're going to be better off only having 10 or 20 females so we can all sit here and really mull it over because um, otherwise it's, it's impossible to analyze all that and it's, it has to be analyzed by humans. It can't just be all laboratories because a laboratory can tell you, oh, this has so many, ter this, so many terpenes and it's so much of these desirable ones and when a human smells it, they go, um, this doesn't smell good. And then something might look like it's not even special, and all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, everybody loves this thing, you know? So you, you have to have, be hands-on, and you can't be hands-on with 100,000 plants in a big old field. It's just not gonna happen. You have to be in touch um, with the plant and actually feel like what it does to you and have other people experience it. So you have to keep it limited um, to a certain point. But that's the difference. If you're just trying to fix one thing, and it's like an agriculture problem, like we need one that's easy to harvest with machines or whatever it is, then yeah, you might want to run out thousands and thousands. You already know everything else is there, but you need to fix that one thing. But if you're just looking for the magic, you're gonna to have to um, really get in there, and you're, you're not doing that with a million, a million plants. We're not gonna know what's there, you know? So um, it just depends on the goals, really, for numbers. I, I think a lot of people exaggerate the numbers they're looking through because it sounds better when there's a number 842 after the plant's name. You know, special skunk 842. And I'm like, how the hell did you smoke 842 of these things and actually keep track of it? It's, it's, it's hard. 
and, and I'm somebody that hunts plants in different directions too because I, I hunt stuff for uh, like biomass. And when you're talking about extraction, it, it is numbers because we're gonna pull it off. And so we can infuse terpenes to these things. And so when, when you're talking large populations, I'm looking for outliers numerically and for specific reasons. But you know what Gene's saying is he's saying if you're gonna smoke this stuff, then ultimately that has to be the test. And it's really hard to smoke that many different varieties and really start to compare them back and forth. And it's a, it's a process. And so populations that are, you know, 50 plants are actually, it's a lot of smoke. You gotta take and then go through them and consume them one after another and log them. And you have to standardize when you smoke them and what was your mental state when you did because otherwise you're putting a, 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 your perception on it. So you're not being objective. And when you're talking huge quantities, a lot of times, you know, that's because you're working with stuff that's not as stable in its reproductive abilities, meaning you're going to see a tremendous amount of deviation from plant to plant. And so that helps you neck down to get a direction. And then from there, you can start to work on refinement. But just like Alana said, I've seen packs that you open the pack up and there was five killers. So there was, you know, ten seeds, five of them were girls. All of them were beautiful. They just took on little different directions on, and you made the choice on where you want it. And then you crack old, you know, packs, you're looking at hundreds and, and none of them are good. And so a lot of it is you have to actually crack some seeds and take a look at what, they, what, they, what they're doing. And that will kind of help you understand how big a population you need to look through. There is no set number. But, but most of the time I see people tell me they look through this many and I'm like, how'd you keep track? And then they look at me and I go, oh, you did. And, and, and it's, it's just kind of, you know, can't afford. And that's not, that's not the point, you know. So sometimes, man, smaller populations, like I look, I look for outliers over the course of years. So I'll go through a population, I'll look at 50, and then I'll keep the, the ones that I believe are best from that 50, and then I'll run another 50, and I'll pull the outliers out from that, and then I can compare the choices I made from each one of those selective groups and compare them against each other and say, hey, is one a clear winner or, or they have different distinctions because a lot of it now is, is where you're selecting for. So if you're selecting your varieties for indoor operations, that's what they're going to get selected. But that doesn't mean it's going to do well in greenhouse, death, or outdoor. And so you, where the selection process happens dictates the number you need, what you want. And then you have to make sure you say this did well here under these circumstances because it doesn't mean you can transfer that selection. So sometimes I'll do multiple selections on the same stock so that I have something that works indoor, something that works outdoor, and they're both pretty similar, but they have different resistances to pathogens. Indoor is a little easier because it doesn't have to have the sensitivity factor to moisture. Where outdoor, it has to have a natural resistance because you can't control that environment. And so all that goes into play. So when you're doing this stuff, you just kind of have to be practical about it yourself and, and don't hold yourself to a constant. Don't be afraid to screw up and hunt. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna make some mistakes while you're looking. You're gonna throw some good ones away, and eventually you start picking up good ones. Awesome. So you just touched on the next question, which is basically the future of cannabis production worldwide seems to be moving into like an outdoor sun-grown setting. Yet we seemingly see a lot of breeding still being done indoors, and pest management and things like mold and fungus are commonly not listed as high on the uh, list of attributes that people are breeding for. So with that in mind, how can people help to you know, select for these traits? We referenced the females that you, know, you can see that. What about males? How do you find males that have got IPM resistance and things like that? Throw them outside, see how they do outside in some nasty ass weather. And if they can handle it, they don't look decrepit and ready to die. Because I mean, some males don't even water them. They're good to go, so hardy, so strong. The structure's there. You give them a little stem rub and they smell insane. Not like the regular, like, uh, smell like everything else, you know what I mean? There's there's always the ones that stand out, especially like, I, I, I wanna say, you know, the torture chamber is always the best way to do it. And it sounds crazy, but, you know, stress them. See how they, how they turn out, I, that's the best way. Yeah, um, it's a trip actually, males, if you, you know, a lot of times people when they're breeding, they don't let the males go long enough to really see what they're gonna do. Um, but I've noticed that males that are from stuff that's not really mold resistant, the males themselves, if you let them run and run and run, the males will actually mold themselves like a female, but a lot of times a lot worse. The whole thing will just turn to mold. Um, there's also a trick um, uh, for selecting males that's really cool that 
I kind of just figured out on accident and I've never heard anybody mention it before, so it's kind of a cool tip. If you actually bud your males all the way out, um, the way a plant grows, everything closest to the tips is gonna go first. That's what really starts flowering first. You know how things toughed up and they flower. That's kind of how it goes. And so what's lower down will be later um, on males. And if you take everything that's already flowered and you leave what's lower and you let it regrow still in flowering mode, it'll want to shoot. And those secondary shoots that come up, they'll actually show what kind of resin that plant produces. They, they won't do it at first. Most people don't know this. This is like top secret info, you know? It, it, will, grow, it will grow back and it'll almost be like you reversed it to be a female. Then you can actually smell the resin. If you really wanted to get nitty gritty, you could actually harvest those little leaves and maybe dry them, stick them in a balm. But you can at least rub the resin on your fingers and feel it and you can tell. And so by taking males not only full term, but longer than full term by cutting them and, and letting them grow back again, um, you'll get actually a whole different look at a male and um, I haven't seen people do it really on purpose, but I've started doing it on purpose. And now I'm able to just smell all my males like they're females and I don't have to reverse them. Because you can reverse males and turn them to females. Um, which if you do that, you can actually make, instead of making feminized seeds, they'll make regular seeds with male and female because the male has that chromosome. Um, but uh, it's definitely a huge trick and it really helps you. And then by doing that too, you see it's, it's in the late stages that most things get attacked by things like mildew and pests. They get tired, they're older plants, they start to break down their health. And so by taking them all the way where they bud, cutting them back and then they grow again, it's like they're really in the latest stages. So they have the most resin production, they have the least resistance to pests and pathogens. And the things that you see get attacked, you're able to note that really easily where you can't do that if you have a male and it drops some pollen you and you collect it then you're you're gonna have to go through the process of growing out the seeds to even know what it did and what a male does it doesn't necessarily pass that but with a lot of the genetics that any of us want to play with that are already desirable at this point especially in the marketplace these things are pretty bottlenecked down and that means that the things that you see in a plant they'll probably carry through in most cases to a certain extent. Whereas if you have a really open population that has everything from like a land race, you might find this really cool plant, but it, the, the, the frequency of those genetics actually popping up in the line are really rare. So um, actually being able to see what the males do in most of the modern stuff we work with, it actually tells you most of what you need to know. and, and, and You'll, you'll, you'll know pretty well what it's gonna do. So that, that I think is the biggest trick to really knowing what those, what those males are gonna do, you know? What's kind of cool now is that you can access lab tech that you couldn't access prior. And so it lets you copy scientific breeding. And there's a, there's a lecture after this one that thinks scientific breeding. And, but the point is that it's accessible and so we, 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 we're more interpretive, intuitive readers, where you look and you feel. And with science, it just helps speed up some of that. You still have to look and feel, because ultimately it's a human perception that dictates the reality of did they like it or did they not. But, you know, with populations now, man, you can, you can bring in stock into the laboratory and test for, for fungal issues. So I can, I can bring a, a leaf sample into a lab and test it for fungal propensity. And it, it lets me see, does it or does it not have so it allows you to actually do breeding. Well, like the question was, if you breed an indoor, how do you go outside? And my thing is I select in the environment that I want the product to be grown in. But now you can use lab technology to help you like really work with an indoor breeding operation where the plants then get tested at a lab and they infect it with the fungal issue. And does it or does it not take hold? And if you have a high resistance and you can say that population is resistant, and for a lot of people as we go forward, you know, like say I like hobby breeders because I think that the, the beauty of working with your own cannabis genetics is something that goes back to the dawn of time. And I think that's what allows people to have an individual relationship with cannabis where they said, hey, look, I did this. This is something I chose because I like it. And that, that, that human connection to the plant to me is the thing that made all of us really go where we are now. So we're in an industrial cannabis society, but fundamentally all of us were just weed lovers and we wanted to be able to dial in stuff we, we dug.
but now you can use technological tools that just make it really pretty fast. And so you can figure out what direction you're going, and then from there it goes back to using your, your intu intuitive skills. And I like that. I like being able to have the tools because ultimately it takes time and, and a, a, pro a process of working out um, what's going to happen and predictability is something that takes a lot of time and a lot of resources and with the ability to have more plants now under you know permits it, it's nice but nonetheless it's still time and energy and money you're having to spend and anything that's going to compress that for you i like and so indoor work which we use for reproduction because it's quick i never used it for selection but now i can take that stock and have it lab infected and then find out same thing we can take it and put any kind of pathogen on it in, in a lab and find out what's its resistance factor and it just speeds it up. Yeah, great answer. So let's say someone's got their line well underway, they like what they've found and they've even got a few of the properties they're looking for within it. At what point should they be worried about potential loss of vigor if they are kind of inbreeding each generation? Would you recommend that they look to outcross or should you really just stick with the one line and just keep working it? It depends how, how the genetics were when you started off, because I've seen genetics get watered down, even mothers. And you know, people regenerate their mothers and you know, sometimes they're not as hardy as you know the first one that you did maybe ten years ago. You know, so I believe that in inline breeding is, is great for that as long as the genetics of the parents are hardy enough to, you know, you're not watering it down. As long as you're going in a direction you're selecting things that are improving it, I think um, inline works great. So with um with uh, inbreeding lines, what happens a lot of times is um, you get this condition called inbreeding depression. And it's argued uh, among people who study genetics uh, what it really comes from. And a lot of the people who are a little more progressive with their thinking on it um, think that it actually comes from the fact that in inbred things, anything, whatever it is, dogs or whatever, um, like people will tell you, oh, German Shepherds, Rottweilers, they get bad hips, it's because they're inbred. It's actually because they're inbred and then they're selected wrong and then they develop these things and you can't get rid of them because the genetics are bottlenecked, meaning that they've gone from being a broad scope of different traits available to being only some things that can actually express themselves from the genetics. So what happens a lot of times is that people say, Oh, and I heard this when I was learning from people, you know, they said, oh, well, we got the genetics and we bred it and we bred it, but then it got tired, so we outcrossed it. And then it was good again and it, because of hybrid vigor, which is what happens when things mix together and the dominant things take over and you don't see all the trippy recessive stuff that's hiding out. But um, the reality of it is that if, let's say, you take like, you know, um, Two, two really different things and you make a really cool hybrid and you get this really cool um, this really cool plants that come out that are basically better than everything that, that you started with. Now if you select those plants and you try different combinations with them, some of those that will actually breed true and it'll stay in there. And you can actually keep that going that direction, but what, what'll happen is as soon as you make a wrong selection that doesn't fit those criteria, stuff will start to kind of, it'll go the direction of what you picked, and when things are inbred because of that bottlenecking, it's, it's like you can think of it like a trail or a road. You can't take turns anymore. So you can't, you can't go back. It's like you can't get there from here, like they say, you know, when you're in a weird neighborhood, like this one over here, I got lost in trying to find the back road. You can't get there from here. We had to go around like eight blocks to get there. It's like just not doable. Now, it's the same thing, like I just said. You might be able to actually get back there if you really, you could take that depressed line and go, well, we're gonna grow. That might be a time when it's worth growing a million plants. Cause you go, look, here's that one, it's still back. Genetics don't ever really go away, but you need huge numbers to find the things that get hidden again and that aren't in there. Um, and the bottlenecking will really hide those. So um, 
with the inbreeding, the thing is that once you're gonna inbreed something, you really need to make the right choices, which in a lot of cases means you need to make yourself lots of options so that you can go back through those again. Otherwise, you're gonna get lost on that trail. You're gonna go the wrong way and you'll never be able to get back there. But if you make lots of options, it's like, you know, it's like being in a corn maze and you'll just walk through the corn real quick and get back in the right spot, you know? So, um, that's really the key and, and, and um, my point being that my belief is that inbreeding depression is a myth that's popularized by people making poor selections just like with bad hips on dogs it's not because they're inbred it's because they're inbred with bad traits you know it's a so yeah it's in the selection process so that's my take on on that i think it's always an option to bring back vigor through through hybridization, and that's a, that's practical if you can find something that's really similar to where it doesn't really matter. That you're like, okay, well, this is really tired, and I have this other thing that has all the same traits. It'll be easy to fix it back up, and we'll be back there and revitalize it. But you don't just want to bring something in um, just to try to fix everything back up. If possible, you want to you want to make the right choices first and after a while what you'll have that you know you won't look at it and go oh this is a tired old <coughs> red line you'll go wow this is an amazing pure line that actually can outperform everything and it's true breeding and it's incredible stuff and that's what you get with horses dogs plants that are bred properly nobody looks at it and goes oh it's the inbreeding depression is struck and it's no good anymore you'll still have maintained that that proper line and then, then it will be a renowned line so that's the that's my take on, on, you know, how the problems that you face when you inbreed stuff versus hybridization, you know. Hybridization is like a quick shortcut to try to fix something back up, but in reality, it's gonna create all this work to try to get, now we gotta get back to square one, you know. So you wanna make the right choices to start and give yourself options. There, there's a phrase called a felal regression, and what it means is that over time, all things reach the average. And so if you're putting quality products together and you're making the selections correctly, then what you'll have is you'll have an overall higher average over the course of time. And when he was talking about the, the, the inbreed, people believe that inbred stuff is terrible because we look at inbreeding with the, the royals, where you've had, you know, that's a really good example because that was something that was common and then you see it in dogs and horses, but they're, they're inbreeding to fix traits. And then a good breeder is pulling out the outliers that have the qualities they want, and they put those back together. But there's a culling process. And in animal breeding, they're culling them and get rid of them. In plant breeding, it's the same thing. You are culling out, and you're being very discerning as to what you're using. And if you're able to take a look at, at the work that you're doing, you can see the direction. Inbred lines are crucial because really that's the only way you can take a trait that you want and put it on top of another plant. And so lines that you build and develop that have characteristics you hold, and then you can use those as material that you would want to outcross to bring in other traits and qualities. But you can take inbred lines that are similar. So I can have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, and I can run these two concurrent lines, same genetic base, but we steer them differently and we can bounce them against each other down the road if we want to see these what we believe like vigor increases, but it's really about tightening up the groups you're working with initially and making good selections. And a lot of times you're gonna make wrong selections. You're gonna find out you chose a plant that when it breeds, it doesn't breed those traits back. And that's why I think it's hard for a lot of people because you have to hold this material. You have to hold seed stock, you have to hold the progenitors that you're using, the male and the female, and it gets to be tough. It's hard to hold large libraries and that's why for me, I like working with people in conjunction, where you do something, someone else does something, and then the two of you can kind of work together to say, hey, let's chase a direction, you chase a direction, and then together we'll be able to solve the problem in a little bit better fashion, so that the plant populations can be smaller for the individual. The amount of material you have to hold can be smaller, and the people that you're working with are gonna see things you don't, because nobody's really all-knowing, no matter what you do. And so to have an ability to, to chase it from different directions, to have other individuals working on these projects in some like loose fashion really helps because it, it allows you a, a lot better chance to find what you're trying to do. Great answer. So 
I think that there's a whole range of questions we could ask, so we've left a little over 10 minutes. If anyone from the audience has any questions, we've got a microphone to your left. Um, looks like Jess is going to control that one. Don't touch the mic. So, am I on? You are. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm really impressed. This panel is the most impressive reading panel I've encountered in years. And so, thank you for your, for your efforts. And your Now, being a troublemaker, my question is, why haven't you mentioned epigenetics? You know, the, the, the advancing learning we have about epigenetic gene expression is totally transforming the, the evolutionary conversation, the breeding conversation, the reproduction conversation. What's your guys' take on where epigenetics fits into your conversation? <laughs> Yeah, I love that one. <laughs> I, I think, you know, it's funny, but it, it, we're, we're learning so much about how information is moved down through genes that I think really we're almost ignorant. So what I know is that every time I think I know something, I find out I, I don't know that much. And, and that's how I feel about epigenetics. You know, we're talking about genetic movement through 14 generations material can be remembered. You can have a transfer of, of information that moves through time. And, and how, does the in, how does the environment influence that? How does the cultivator's uh, direction influence that? And I don't think that we really understand it that well because we, we've worked off of these very simplified breeding methodologies. And then when we started to get into scientific breeding, it was basically from markers, but the understanding of how information moves through time and, and what the impact is, is something I don't think we really understand that well. We don't honestly, and I and I know that it's it's a, a huge conversation that's coming, but it's one that has to happen with cultivators, geneticists, and breeders, so we can take a look and figure out you know what moved through time. And the problem with cannabis is that a lot of the older material is gone, and a lot of the older people that started the, the pro project is gone, and so now it's you're you're kind of in the middle of the picture moving forward. So it's hard to really figure out what moved from the past. Where were we? We, we kind of know where we are and we know where we want to go, but I don't think we really know where we were. And we've cut back so much of the native populations around the globe that you can't really go back and start to source this material and start to compare it on a, on a DNA level to see what, what changed and what didn't change and why. And so I think that, 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 that the question is brilliant it's just that I don't think any of us at this point are really qualified to, to steer it, you know? No one is, actually. Yeah, but it's, it's fascinating to see that truth that information moves forward. It's why, you know, they say, you know, talent skip a generation, but you'll see families in, in anything, plant, people, animal, where there's just unbelievable traits that move through time and trying to capture it is hard, but for some reason it seems to, it seems to travel. And then there's things that get lost. So, good question. Oh. Great, do you have another question? Um, well, I, in, in listening, I've heard all three of you say things that it sounds to me would amalgamate really, really well. Testing by torture, for instance, which is, I call bomb-proofing, so that it gets easier and easier for someone to be able to produce a given genetic. Uh, if you do this, you're good, but if you do that, you're good too, instead of this is what you have to do to find you for that plan. But can we, this, can we combine scientific reading where we're looking at pretty much having to have a lab tech in the process on the fast in your breeding and preserve hybrid vigor by taking a parent line, splitting off into looking for different traits but with the same initial genetics and breeding for specific traits that are desirable there, then bring those lines back and by doing that, not be introducing alien alleles, but regaining hybrid vigor. I think that's totally possible, especially if, like I said, 
the parents that you first chose from are both genetically stable and hardy. As long as you're picking the traits that are furthering the genetics, I think that, you know, going further, even with phylos, you know, it'd be great to use the scientific, you know, versus of basically sending in all your genetics, seeing what and what isn't, you know, bad with pathogens and, and, you know, what can handle what without even having to, you know, torture your plants, you know, as I was saying. Um, but honestly, within, within keeping with the genetics that you personally keep with and, and stabilizing with just the choice of, you know, terpene profile, the cannabinoid profile, that's the best thing of scientists that we have is that we can test our cannabis now. We couldn't do that, you know, just so odd years ago, you know, that we're finding new cannabinoids like the THCV, you know, I, I didn't even realize there was cannabinoids that we, there's what, 130 something different ones now, or plus, right? So it's, it's crazy, I mean, cannabis has more of a genetic background than humans. They have like, I think it's maybe 48, don't quote me, and humans have maybe 32. So with cannabis, it's so much more complex than even humans, it's, it's worth still learning with it, and it's amazing. Yeah, um, in, in, in anything that we consider pure, there's still those variations, and you might discover like, okay, well we have these ones that, well, this one really has the terpenes we want, but this one really has the resistance, and you can go ahead and breed those apart, and even if they were originally the same, if you breed them apart for long enough, and do what you're saying, this, you know, it's line breeding, so you make these different lines of the same thing, when you come and you put them back together, you'll actually get some hybrid vigor, again, even though it's the same thing, and when you do that, then all of a sudden you're gonna have an improvement over both those lines, so it's really worth, like what I like to do with anything, even if I consider it all one thing, I have all these different lines that go in different directions, and after a while, different ones prove to do different things, and you can really use them to come back together to, to remake those, so that it is really valuable, and I mean, it's really common you can look at it like with dogs. If you go, I have these, these Rottweilers, they've been in California for 85 years and they've been bred really, really well. And, um, you know, I want to, you know, you go ahead and breed them with something that somebody still has in Germany and make these new dogs. And it's like, you know, that you might all of a sudden wind up with this dog breed that's just, dog breed that's incredible. And it's really the same breed. It's just Rottweilers, but they're really not the same because they're, they're different lines. And so, by doing that, that would be a way, like we were talking about with like bad hips with dogs. You could go all of a sudden, okay, well, we just brought in the same thing, but it repaired what was messed up by, by the inbreeding. And um, so doing the different lines is really good, and I like to do that. I don't like to just run one direction really fast and get it all there. I like to take it in a few different directions and go, okay, this is the one, this is gonna be the one that's, that's great with the smell and the taste and it's green. And, this one over here has all the resistance and it's purple and they were originally the same thing. But then you have these two versions and then when you put them back together, it's like you, you've, you've, you've remade it and when you remade it, it actually made it better than it was when you started. But it's still the same thing. So you, you really can do it and it's, it's worthwhile and um, it is one of the more practical things you can do um, in a program for sure. Yeah. In, in, in any major crop, major crop just means commoditizing globally. That would be rice, corn, wheat. It's 10 years on a development cycle. So three years of uh, locating markers, another three years of putting together your breeding lines, and then four years of running out those lines. And you're running thousands of lines and you're looking through millions of plants to find what you're really looking for as these parental lines. That, that lets you get that type of stability that people believe. When you buy a pack of seeds for vegetables, you see a stability that you don't quite understand how much work and time went into it. And the problem that we have is that in cannabis, because, and this is not good, but tech drives cannabis, it's where most of the investment money is coming from. So tech expectations are instantaneous. To them, 18 months is a friggin' lifetime. But in cannabis, that's just that's, that's a season and a half outdoor. And that's maybe, you know, five or six runs inside where you really did some hunting and looking. It's not a big deal. And I, I think that most people just lack the funding. And so there is no heavily funded breeding operations where people can go and really chase this stuff down the road and get these things that you want without having to make concessions financially. You can't, you can't play Frankenstein without 
a, a castle filled with goodies to do that. And I don't know how many people have it, and I don't, I don't think that because the, the tech industry is pushing cannabis, that the understanding that you might be in business in 10 years, because to me, tech is just unbelievably volatile. And it's changed the way we approach cannabis. And so to me, you know, if you can get a longer view and realize that it's gonna take a longer amount of time to stabilize and get those things, and you'll have them. But if it takes major agricultural corporations that have unlimited resources and a technology we can't touch, and it takes them 10 years and a million selection to get there, it's kind of hard for us to do it the way we do it. And we get lucky, we pull out liars out the work. But the stability that people believe you should have in cannabis based off of what they've purchased from other agricultural commodities in any form is so different, is so skewed between those two groups. And I think you have to rein your expectations in and, and that's where the population start to work and you start to say, hey, I have stuff that works in this direction. I got something nasty, Gina. I want you to check it out and see if you can work with it. And Alana's got quality material. She says, Gina, I got some nasty stuff. I want to play with you on this. And all of a sudden you're able to team up like I talked earlier. But there's no way one individual is going to fund that level of breeding project with over the course of time because nobody can really make decisions on what the public's tastes are going to be. It's a strange du jour kind of market. And so the problem is that whatever's hot is what's hot. So anything that's hot this year, everything's crossed into it. I don't give a shit. Every year, show me what's hot and I'll show you single pollen into 40 of the hot cuts. Next year, 40 of the hot cuts. 40 of the hot cuts. It, it's, I call it strain du jour. And the problem with that is it doesn't allow you to really build anything of any stability, which is what you're seeking. Alrighty, so I think that might bring us to the end of our time frame. My name's Heavy Days. I'd love it if you could all join me giving a hand for the other panelists.